I can and I am. Okay. It's okay for me to drink water and stuff. Here, right? <coughs> no. Oh, gosh, no. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how professional it is on the other end. Yeah. Well, part of this is we're rebroadcasting it as if it was live. So broadcasting any- now? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I like we're recording. It. I like the grooming. It looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I got my toothpaste too to be fair. Either one of you have bad breath. So. Perfect. Yep. And good morning, good afternoon, actually, everyone. Hey, it's Thursday, and we are in for a treat. Um, we already heard from Kevin Knebel, and this afternoon, Brad and Lisa, but right now, strap in, set aside your smartphones and your emails and everything else to intrude. You're going to have a fantastic hour with our next presenter, Ford Taylor. Ford is the founder of SHH Strategy Consultants, which is comprised of transformational leadership training and the FSH Strategy Consultant Division, and the charitable FSH Foundation. Ford is known as a man who can solve complex business issues with straightforward practical solutions while maintaining his focus on the people that serve the organization. After completing a business management degree from Texas A&M, he jumped into becoming an owner-operator of a small apparel company named CC Creations. That small company grew to the publicly traded Brazos Sportswear from a few investors to a $300 million operation. Let me say that again, a $300 million operation. In 1997, Ford and his family moved to Cincinnati to serve as CEO of the growing company. Ford eventually left the role as CEO of Brazos Sportswear to help grow and develop other companies through his business consulting. Uh, Further, he went on to start the Ministry of Transformation Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, for the purpose of unifying leaders across the region to impact improvement in their local communities. Due to the rising market demands, he then founded FSH Strategy Consultants. This company is currently comprised of teams that provide leadership training and strategic consulting. Individuals and teams achieve transformation by addressing and removing personal and professional constraints. He is known and dearly loved for his passion to see lives and organizations better equipped to serve their communities and families. He's co-author of the book, The Hike, which contains many of the principles found in the transformational leadership material. And this material itself is the result of specific solutions to a long history of transforming multiple companies and individual lives. Ford and his wife of 32 years, Sandra, live in Cincinnati uh, and Texas, as we found out. They're blessed with three lovely daughters, Whitney, Emily, and Quincy. Uh, And Ford just got back fresh from a trip to Trinidad and Tobago uh, so we're so excited that he could uh, spend some of his healing time from the beach with us to share his <laughs> message. Glad you could make it and, and appreciate you making the time for it. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, Ford, we're, I'm so glad that you could join us also. And just to let the audience know, uh, Ford has just become just a personal friend and mentor to me in, in just taking everything in Ford's life and what he's Ford. learned and applying it to our business, our company, my lives and relationships has just been, you know, we use this word transformational. What does it mean for it, right? Permanent change. And, and what, is, what it has done in my life is permanent change for the better. So, uh, you know, if you're an entrepreneur out there, trust me, sit down, grab a, a pad of paper, uh, have a pen and take notes as we go through this because what, what Ford is going to share, because here's, here's the exciting thing uh, in Ford, I'd love for you to start out a little bit about the early journey, but you got out of college and you were what, 22, 23 years old and you bought CC creations, which was owned by a bunch of bikers. This was not a thriving business. And you <laughs> took that to a $300 million company. And how many employees did you have? Well, approximately 2000. And so everything that he used to create that growth is what is what he now calls transformational leadership. And there's a number of investors, venture capital firms that will not invest in the company unless the leadership, the management has actually gone through transformational leadership. So Ford, thank you for making the time. I wanted to throw that additional personal intro in there. And I'd love to have you start for the people that don't know you, maybe share a little bit of that backstory before we jump in. Well, I appreciate that, John. It's always fun to be with you, brother. Always, whether it's on a computer or it's better face to face, but love to see you anytime we can. So thank you for all you're doing all over the globe and the impact that you're having because you're you're a blessing, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Ford. 
Yeah, the, the, the funny part is I, the first thing that you pointed out was we need to get our website changed because we've been married for 35 years. <laughs> so that tells you. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for letting me know very quickly. We got a bad, we got an old website out there. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, John, like you said, uh, you know, I met Sandra in college. And when I graduated, she was a freshman when we met. So we got married when she was a junior. So I stayed in College Station, Texas and worked at a local sporting goods store that I had been working at during college because one of her dreams was to graduate from A&M. And she graduated in May of 82. And I was working at a sporting goods store where we, part of what we did was we sold uniforms. And we had a screen printer that would put the numbers and names and things on the uniform. The bank called me and said, they're gonna close that screen printer down because they were going into bankruptcy. A couple of days later, they called back and said, hey, any chance you might wanna own this? And being, you know, all of 24 going on to 25, uh, I had never heard the term due diligence. So I said, sure. <laughs> I'm in. We didn't do any due diligence. One page contract, called my parents, borrowed a little bit of money uh, and started down this road of trying to fix this company. A few months, a few months into it, we were quite sure we weren't going to make it. Uh, one night just came up with a strategy and the next morning went out and tried that strategy and, and things turned around. And over the next few years, we grew quite rapidly. I got a call from some venture capitalists. They wanted to buy a piece of the company, use their money and our strategy. And so what we did was we actually had a strategy that we would go in, we would buy broken companies, which I had done by this point a number of times myself, uh, go in, uh, teach, train and equip, as you will hear me talk about on this, the management team there of how to operate that company uh, leave it with them, and then go buy another one. Yeah. And so from that, we grew that uh, company to, like you said, a, approximately $300 million and uh, eventually became the CEO of that, which took me from College Station to, to Cincinnati because we moved the corporate office up there at one point because we had hired another CEO, and that wasn't working out. So I stepped into that role and ended up in Cincinnati. So, so Ford, I want to jump in because the, 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 that journey is a tremendous one. And, and when I talk to startup entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, they're often focused on that first leap, that first phase. So I'm curious that what was the strategy you came up with um, that, that turned that first company around? Well, I, I think the, the audience we're talking to will appreciate this because uh, it, it probably, I found since then, it's a lot easier to start a company than it is to buy one that has a terrible reputation. Hmm. Because basically, no one would do business with us. And, and the truth is, I called my mom one night. Let's just go ahead and, and be very transparent. And, and I, I called my mom and dad because they had loaned me, uh, I was $5,000 short to buy the company. I, I had worked through college and they paid my way through college. So I came out with no debt and I had quite a, a bank account because I also, believe it or not, taught dance lessons for 18 years. And that was very profitable back then. <laughs> and so, but we had some money to get started, but I did have to borrow some from them. And of course, $5,000 then would be a lot more now. Um, and I called them to tell them we probably weren't going to make it, uh, but I would get another job and pay them back the money I owed them. And I'll never forget. My mom said to me, honey, before you make that decision, go home tonight and pray and see if you wake up tomorrow morning with something different. Mm. And, uh, and the next morning I woke up with a strategy. I called our, our one salesperson, I said, take off your tie, put on your blue jeans and pull your shirt tail out and put on your tennis shoes and meet me at the office. And so we went like that to the next town over uh, instead of the town we lived in. And we started calling on people and everybody that day bought product from us. Mm -hmm. We then came back to our town and I started going to the old customers. And I, again, you know, when you're 25 years old, you can get away with some things that I wouldn't be able to get away with at 58. <laughs> And I would go in their office and say, I know our company has a terrible reputation. We've not delivered on time. Our quality has been bad. I am the new owner and I'm just going to irritate you until you give me another chance. And so every day I'm going to come by and see you. But if you'll give me an order today, and if we do mess it up, you have my word. We'll never call on you again. But if we do it right, if we meet the delivery time with better quality than you're getting, I would ask that you would continue doing business with us. And they started saying, okay. Uh, I remember one client actually, I was asking the salesman, why were, why were they not doing more? We met and went and met with them together. They said, because you can't handle our business. 
And I literally said, I'll be right back. And she said, where are you going? I said, I've got some knee pads out in the car. I'm going to go put them in. I'm going to come back in and beg you. And she said, sit down. And, and she gave us more orders than we'd ever had. <laughs> and she said, if you can deliver this two weeks from Tuesday, you got my business. And we delivered it a week early and she was kind of blown away. So I would say to young entrepreneurs, uh, mm -hmm. if you've heard this before, it sounds cliche, but it really is true. Under promise, over deliver. Mm -hmm. And if you're serving your client and if you serve your client and, and they will want to do business with you. Uh, well, I also pick up something from that Ford that, that it, it's, it's interesting. You drive by and you see the signs, especially in restaurants under new management. And, and, and I always say as a marketer, is that the best you could put on the sign? Like seriously, basically you're telling me the previous guys suck. Please give us a chance, but you're not even saying that you took it one step. Well, a big step further. You were transparent. You shared the weaknesses and you said, here's my plan to fix it, right? So you, you, I mean, that's, that's a really good lesson because a lot of us get involved in businesses that are struggling. Uh, that's part of life as an entrepreneur. And for those entrepreneurs that are starting their first business, if you don't think it is, don't start, <laughs> right? But so when, when you're faced with that struggle, that transparency, what a huge, huge lesson I think that is. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that, you know, we teach in the training we do now is that the strongest leaders are vulnerable, they're transparent, and they, we have a six-step apology that we now teach that wasn't official in the early days, but now it's an official process that we use on how to deal with customers and the processes and how to deal with upset customers, and within that is a six-step apology that we teach. And, and we actually grew our company by telling our employees, you know, you're going to make mistakes, I'm going to make mistakes, please just don't make one big enough that puts us out of business. And if you make one, I would tell them, I will teach you how to get a customer for life. So if you make one, just grab me, and I'm going to teach you how to make that mistake a customer for life. And, and so we use those principles, and very fortunate that, oh, that the principles it. everybody. Love it. Well, and you have a philosophy, too. Uh, so let me ask you a question for it. Is the customer always right? Well, you know, you hear that the customer is always right. The customer comes first. And of course, you know, we teach that that's a lie. Uh, you know, when you, when you say lies to your staff or your employees or even your customers, they think you're not very smart. And, and one of the things I believe is that smart people want to do business with smart people. Nice. And so the truth is the customer is not always right, but they are always the customer. And the customer comes second. And if you take care of your employees, in other words, your employees come first. If you take care of your staff and your employees, you won't have to worry about your customers. Oh. And how, you know, before you talk about, you know, you'd go into these companies, teach, train, and equip. Uh, can you share what that looks like? What are those things that you're teaching the employees that really has built these extraordinary cultures that every place that I know of where you've worked in uh, just thrives and grows? Well, you know, one of the things I believe is there's this top 10 reasons for success that I believe in. And number one is quality. Number two is service. Number three is continuous ongoing improvement. And number four is the other seven don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Try to teach them if you outperform your competition in quality and service, and you're always looking to improve what that is, then you're going to be successful because you don't get stale where other people learn how to outperform you. And so we basically say there's, there's three reasons. And John, you know that I believe anytime two or more people are in a relationship, that's an organization. Mm -hmm. so the principles you're asking me about, you know, they don't, only, they don't only work for companies, they work for marriages and families and classrooms. And, but since we're focused on, you know, on companies today and, and entrepreneurs, I understand that, Every relationship that you have in your organization, two or more people, is an organization also. Hmm. Your company is an organization, but your relationship with every individual that works with you is an organization. Your, uh, your bankers, that relationship's an organization. Your vendors, your customers. And if you treat them all that way, then you have a whole lot more success. And within those relationships, if you have influence with one person, that makes you a leader. So your, your whole organization is made up of leaders. And so you, you treat them all as if they're leaders. And, and John, I say that to answer your question that, you know, the, what I believe the purpose of leadership is, is, as you know, is to cast vision. 
And once you cast the vision to serve your staff, your employees, by teaching, training, and equipping them. And when you do teach, train, and equip them, only then can you empower them. Once they're empowered, you let go so they can do their part. And if they're feeling like they're part of the organization by doing their part, because you really have empowered them, then your job becomes to evaluate how they're doing and their role moving towards the vision that you cast as the entrepreneur. And if you cast an inspiring vision that they also want to be a part of, they will want to join your team. And if you teach, train, equip them, then you're really going to hit a home run. Mm-hmm. You know, and we, we've, you know, during this summit, we've heard some people that just have some amazing visions that they've cast for their team. Um, you know, in, in that process for working with leaders, where, where would our places where people get stuck or have challenges with that? Well, I think a lot of the leaders don't really uh, understand and maybe have never even been told the difference between teaching, training, and equipping. Mm-hmm. And most of us are pretty good at teaching, you know, at telling people what to do. But when you understand the, the research to know that if you just tell somebody something, that 24 hours later, uh, they have the brain capacity to remember about 5% of it. Now, there are those people that have photographic memories. We're not talking about those outliers. We're talking about normal people like you and me. And if I know they can only remember 5% of it the next day, whether that's a child or an employee, then, t- then just teaching, just telling them. You know, and I wonder why they're not doing it. Well, because they really can't remember. Mm. They do need to be told. But they do need to be taught. So when I tell my team all this information and two days later it never got done and I'm annoyed with my team, it's not really their fault. It's my fault as a leader because I didn't really give them the tools that they needed to do what I expected. That's my belief, John. And that's what we teach. You know, no, no organization can move beyond the constraints of its leadership. And if you don't know the difference between teaching, training, and equipping, then you may stu- be stuck in the teaching mode. You know, and training is actually letting them experience it. And when they're experiencing it, you're doing delegation. In other words, you don't jump from teaching or telling to empowerment. You have to go through the delegation delegation part, which is the training. They get some hands-on experience with you because you're the expert, you're the visionary. And then from that, even if you give them all that and they don't have the actual tools, the actual equipment to be able to go do it, then they're not fully equipped. And so the three are very connected. It's like the fingers on your hand. You know, they're all very different, but they're also very connected. In other words, they make up the hand, but the teaching, training, and equipping are different. But when you do all three, when you do empower, your stress goes down as the, as the owner, as the visionary. Their stress goes down. You've told them. You expect them to make some mistakes. You have the tools that if they do make them, how to get a customer for life, and then your company can, th- can flourish. What a great way to break it down. Uh, and, and it's interesting, as you were saying that, I flash back to my first job at McDonald's. And, you know, I mean, I, I often would say this, this is a multi-million dollar restaurant run by 16 and 17 year olds that, you know, most people don't realize it's a multi-million dollar restaurant, They're, you know, per unit, per dollar of volume, one of the most profitable restaurant operations on planet Earth. And they're typically run by 16 and 17 year olds. But boy, do they do train teach, train, and equip well. Yes, they do. Right? They got that down to a science. I remember you, know, you, had, you, you weren't allowed. They've changed this now, sadly, in the, in the current version of McDonald's. But, but when I was trained, you, you weren't allowed on lobby, you know, cleaning the tables, until you were certified on every single station inside the kitchen. So you knew every product, every, every single ingredient, every, how they were made, and you'd made them. And then you were allowed, you were granted the right to clean tables with the public. And I remember when I first heard that, I'm like, how could that possibly be? I mean, it's like cleaning tables. No, it's not cleaning tables. It's engaging with every single customer. How was your meal? What was good about that? You got a challenge. Let me fix that. And of course, in order to do that well, you had to know what was in each of the sandwiches or whatever the product was. And, and it wasn't until later when I left that organization and I look back, and I went, oh, look at that. Look at that. How great was that? Because when I ended up opening my own fast food restaurants, you know, the practical reality is cleaning tables was what you do as soon as you had a new person on board because they could do that without much coaching. 
but they couldn't do all the rest of it. So uh, that not that fascinating? Even at that level, right, in a, in a startup organization, the importance of that with a 16-year-old staff member. Love it. Absolutely. I think you saw Chick-fil-A take all that to another level because they're the ones that initially went out and understood the customer service at the car and at the table alongside yep. really doing the kitchen, what we would call the back office in a company, but the, the background there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and actually, they're a great example because they just expanded. I, I happen to live in Vancouver, but I do most of my business with Americans. So it's kind of nice. I speak both languages, Canadian and American. <laughs> it's a gift. You know, we all have our gifts. And uh, I'm from Texas. I teach Texan and American. I Texan and American. Same thing. Exactly. <laughs> And, and I remember going to my first uh, Chick-fil-A that made it across the border. It was at Calgary Airport. And in the Calgary Airport, I, I was walking by outside security and I saw this. I'm like, Chick-fil-A? They're not in Canada? Sure enough, that's where they started, right there. And so I stopped up and everything about that experience was what I experienced at the Chick-fil-A's in the U.S. Yeah. And this was run by Host Marriott in an airport which means, I mean, Host Marriott's a huge multinational chain that, you know, they, they, they own more franchises, different brands than any company in the world. A lot of people don't know that, but you'll see them in the airport and they run it. There was the same level of friendliness, the same level of service. And I thought, wow, isn't that neat how it can scale cross-border, cross-culture, and in this big organization that's doing it on this, as a sideline. So you must have seen that too when you when you when the organizations that's where the scale comes from, right? When they've got those three elements down, then they can scale. Is that what you're saying? Well, they can. There's a lot more than just those three elements. Right. But, but that's three of the main elements. To understand the you know the definition and the purpose and the values in which you lead. If, if you understand all three of those and you connect them together, you can be an absolutely powerful. Leader. But if you don't understand the qualities and skills which is what I call the values, connected to the purpose, connected to the definition. But when you put all those three together, now as a leader, you hit a grand slam. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, that has been really helpful for me personally. Uh, you know, as we started this new company for it, I would love for you to share for everybody listening, uh, maybe walk them through <clears throat> how they would do that for whatever their business they're in or what they're thinking about. Very powerful. Okay. Well, John, as you know, one of the reasons we even started doing this transformational leadership coaching, training, equipping that we do is because, you know, I traveled the world early in my career as we were expanding that first company. Uh, and then, of course, I travel a whole lot more now. Uh, I stayed at home for about 10 years because I wanted to finish strong at home with my children. But uh, in both of those um, times of travel, I found that most people in the world were really smart gifted or talented in at least one area. Now, many of them are that in, in multiple areas, but everybody's at least one. And, and I also found that most people have huge hearts. But then I started asking my question, the, the big question I would ask myself is, why if all those people have big brains and big hearts, why is that not who we read about in the paper? Why is that not, yeah. you know, on the news? And what I started realizing is that leadership is like a cake. And and when you make a cake, there's certain ingredients, there's certain uh, utensils or tools that you need. You need a recipe manual. And I started realizing that guys with my hair color, most of us had been taught really well how to manage, but very little about how to lead. And, and, and as I started seeing, uh, looking back on the career of why all these organizations were so successful, I started realizing that uh, you know, as you know, John, at one, I, I was pretty arrogant. I thought I was God's gift to business. And, and I realized looking back on that, that these tools and ingredients and behaviors actually work for everybody. It had nothing to do with how <laughs> smart the business man. So that'll humble you pretty quickly. Um, but, when, but when all those mixes, you know, when you mix all that together, and, and when you are talking about the quality, skills, attributes of a leader, some of those things that go into that cake are a little bit like flour and, and baking powder and oil. They, they don't taste so good on their own. Huh. But when you mix them with the sugar and the salt and the water and the milk and the chocolate that do taste good on their own, all of a sudden all blended together, that there's a pretty good tasting cake and there's a pretty high level leader. And so when, when you take what we believe is the definition is someone who's willing to lay their life down for those with whom they lead or influence. And we're not talking about physically dying, we're talking about casting a vision 
that others can rally around that encourages them and inspires them to move toward that product or that vision because they feel something in themselves that that's where they want to be. And if they can do that, and if they come with what we call desired qualities and skills, you know, things like being a visionary, being coachable, you know, being a good listener, walking in humility. Now getting to that place can be a lot of flour. I mean, it's hard to, to lay your life down for the people who work for you. Mm -hmm. you know, equals, you know, not to, to look over them, not to look down on them. I mean, to understand that they do look up to you. They may see you like a mother or a father, but if you look at them like a friend and you treat them that way, but, but when you do cast that vision and walk in humility, you're honest, you have integrity. They never have to question whether they can trust you or not. When you have all those things, you know, laughing is a great leadership skill. You know, there's nothing wrong as a leader with crying. If there's something that you're passionate about and tears come, you don't have to fight them back. Share that with your team. When they see that, that's the, that's the kind of leader they want to follow, someone who's real. They're not fake. They're not wearing a mask. You know, they share that you're human. You know, our team even now knows, you know, I may make the most mistakes on the team. I'm sure, I sure admit a lot more of them than anybody else, but and I'm okay with that. I mean, I want them to know when I make a mistake because I want them to maybe even help me fix what I've done. Mm -hmm. Kinds of qualities and skills. And when you, when you take those attributes, those qualities and skills, and you really are willing to cast vision and serve your team by teaching, training, and equipping them, which is V-Steel, V-S-T-T-E-L, V-Steel and Lead. When you put all that together, it's amazing that people want to be a part of that team. You know, you just used a term, and I know this is part of your training, V-Steel. Could you expand on that a little bit for everybody listening? Because this is a, this is a template on how to really <clears throat> uh, create extraordinary leadership and, and an extraordinary team that you're working with. Right. Well, V-Steel really is what we've been talking about. It really means that first you cast vision. Now, a lot of people use one of two different organizational models. A lot of them will use top-down, which some people call command control or in-charge model. That means everything comes back up to who's at the top box in that organization. Uh, a second group have written books called Servant Leadership, where they say lead from the bottom. And I believe that both of those models have some flaws in them. Uh, the top down is command control, and what you'll find is that many people that use that do have a lot of financial success, but their people are stressed. Typically, there's a lot of turnover in the company, and normally they have to pay their employees more. Well, then they may have a change of heart, and then they try the servant leadership model. Well, the servant leadership model may be the right model, but most of those models don't have accountability. You know, they don't, don't, they don't hold the people accountable, so they become dysfunctional. And in both models, you end up with a lot of conflict. And so in this V steel model, we basically use those models, but we change the name. So with the, the top down, we don't call it command control. We call it the visionary model. And so the top person, the owner, if you will, in an organization is the visionary of that organization. Once they cast the vision, their job is now to flip that model upside down. And now they serve their team, which is what we've been talking about. So that's the V and the S through teaching, training, and equipping. And as they teach, train, and equip, they'll see those two models morph together, and it, it really becomes a model that looks more like an organism, which we call the functional responsibility model. Here's where role clarity takes place. People are working together based on the level of relationship. And, and this is the third model that we teach, and that takes place in the teach, train, and equip. And if people stay in that model long enough, that model starts merging closer together where the relationships get stronger. People start wanting the other people within their organization, the other managers, their departments, to be successful too because they realize as an organization, we're way better off if we're all successful than if I'm more successful than you are in your department. Well, eventually, uh, and in that place is when we can really start empowering and start letting go. And that moves us into the fifth model for all those, if you will, we call them bubbles. We, they're not boxes anymore, that they actually start overlapping. And now you have a full uh, model of overlap that we call continuous improvement model. Now the team's working together. They're walking in transparency, vulnerability. They've been given the tools, which we teach early in the model, how to resolve conflict, 
uh, how to deal with it if you have a conflict, how to, how to get role clarity, all these different tools and ingredients and behaviors, and what keeps people from being able to do it, to be able to move, to be able to do it. So the V-Steel model, while it, it sounds great, cast vision, serve, teach, train, equip, empower, let go, and evaluate, there's actually organizational models and tools and ingredients in each model to walk through those stages. Yeah, you can't jump from level two to level five to continuous improvement, can you? It's a, it's a process to get there. Yeah, you have to go down the continuum. You know, a lot of people want to. I mean, that's what most leaders want to do. You know, they don't want to take the time to build the safety in the visionary stage to get people safe where the trust is built, where they really can trust each other to get to a place where they start coming together to become cohesive, if you will, in that serving stage. And as that starts happening and trust and cohesiveness takes place, then we can actually have open, honest conversations about role clarity, uh, about pricing, about delivery, about vision, without conflict, people. right? Conflict, yeah, conflict's a big one. You know, gossip, you know, how do we stop gossiping in an organization? You know, we, we teach tools on how to do that. And as all those things come down, productivity goes up. What a fascinating model, guys. And I, no wonder, John, you wanted uh, Ford to share his wisdom because that's like, there's like about 800 elements there. <laughs> And so I got to ask, because I'm a, I'm a student of learning, how does someone learn this? I mean, there's so many pieces and parts, and I know you teach it, but how do you teach it? Like, what's the model that you use? What does it take? How many, like, what are the layers? What's the model that, that someone, if someone like me wants to learn this, because I do, what's the model? Well, we have, we have some different models. You know, one is, uh, you know, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching and help people one-on-one -on -one with that. Another is, as you know, we have a, a consulting company that we go into companies and we help them learn these models and we teach them. And then the third model is we have something called TL On Demand where people can go in one-on-one -on -one and get all of this in a virtual interactive training platform uh, that they can apply to their own lives and then apply to any organization that they have influenced. Again, that could be their company, which is what we're talking about today. It could be their family, their church, their ministry, their sports team, because we, we love to see these models work in all those different areas. And the, and the biggest part about this model is if you truly are a leader who understands that if you serve your team, if you serve your customers, if you serve your church, your sports team, your ministry, your children, if you serve them, they will follow you. Hmm. Love it. You know, I, I, what I want, I want to throw out there because there's a client that I had come to me about a year ago. I went, I had been through TL and been applying it to our company and I worked with Ford to integrate this into my client's company. It was, uh, <clears throat> they've been in business for two years. They were at a half a million dollars of revenue. Their, <clears throat> their turnover rate, 40% of their employees were turning over and there's a lot of business owners out there. They're probably maybe even plateaued and they're frustrated. Mm -hmm. right. And so we cast this vision of what a culture of continuous improvement would look like. And it took us a solid uh, 14 months. So this isn't overnight. It takes some time. But here's what's happened now. In the last year since we started this process, even though this, you know, this was step by step, they have, their revenues are up 360%. They did over $2 million in revenue last year mm -hmm. and their retention rate is a hundred percent. They've had no turnover since we started this process in the last year. So everything that Ford is sharing everybody out there and Ford, I know you have so many more stories than I do, uh, but these, you know, you're talking about tools, ingredients and recipes. But when you take these from somebody who knows how to bake that cake, that when some, you know, that one person, when you're having a party, you want them to bake that cake because they just do it yeah. so well, yeah. right? Everybody has the recipe like for Toll House chocolate chip cookies, but there's one person yeah. who's the best, right? That's Ford. And so I want Ford to bring his cake over and show me how to make it. You know, in Ford, there's been a theme through all this also that I'd love for you to dive a little deeper on. In uh, the word values keeps coming up in my mind and you've said it. And it seems like there's a pretty significant importance on personal and corporate values and how, what that looks like in the interplay of all this. Well, John, you know my story and you know a lot of this training uh, not only comes from the successes that I've been fortunate to have, uh, they are fortunate enough to have, 
uh, they also come from a lot of failures. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of my personal failures are also what have helped, you know, build this training because, you know, my public life and my private life were not lined up. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was at the top of the trade journals, you know, the arrogant guy, actually spiritual gifts pastor at my church, uh, yet I was cheating on my wife. And those kinds of things uh, can drive you nuts interpersonally. Hmm. And so I became very ill, uh, actually became suicidal. Uh, if, if there was a medicine that you could take for your liver or your stomach or your headache or, you know, my face was breaking out, that they ran a test on me that at 41 years old, I tested to be 79. And so what I found out is that when all that's going on and your private life and your public life are not lined up, that you can claim your values to be one thing and maybe even use them and they work in one place and you're not using them. Therefore they don't work in another place. Mm. That's what I started realizing is that, hold it, there's way more to this than just being successful financially or just being successful in a business. And I started using what I used at work at home. And amazingly, I've got a great marriage now. Uh, and it's the same woman. Uh, you know, people say, how long have you been married? Or, and I said, man, I've been happily married for 25 years. Been married for 35, but I've been happily married. <laughs> <laughs> but that was all on me. That was not on her. All right. So I started realizing that through that arrogance, you know, through that being at the top of your industry, uh, people calling you the golden boy, that that can go to your head. And it went to my head. Hmm. And I had a lot of failures. So a lot of this training we do, you know, those ingredients, some of them come from the failures. Because I, if people have not had some of the failures, I love, John, you know, and, and if you're out here and, and you're between 25 and 35, or, and you're in that millennial crowd, hear me, please. You can get this done. You know, you can change the world. My color hair, we've made a lot of mistakes. And, and, and a lot of guys that look like me, when they hear you, you know, when we said the same things you say in the 1970s, we were called hippies. I mean, we were the guys, you know, we just didn't really want to work hard. You know, we just, we want to change the world through smoking pot and which I never did, but, but in those things, but that isn't what you're saying. I hear you. I know you're saying that, yes, you want to be financially successful, but you want to be significant. You want to, you want to make a positive change. Please find someone that's got some gray hair like me that understands that we've made the mistakes and you can fix them, mm -hmm. but find someone who's willing to share with you your mistakes, the mistakes that they've made so you don't make them again. And part of what we do, John, you know, in TL is to, is to show people how not to make those mistakes. And if they happen to have made them, how to overcome those mistakes, whether it's in their business or their personal lives. But, you, but that, this millennial generation, I know, that you know the difference. See, we, we have books, which I love the book halftime. I mean, that, that term halftime, I love it. But you don't have to wait till halftime. <laughs> okay? Absolutely. You yeah, and the subtitle of the book, Halftime, is Success to Significance. And it speaks to people that have already had financial and personal success. And then now they're kind of trying to figure out what's next and how to be significant. And Ford, I love that you're bringing this up, right? Because we you can combine both of those together when you're 25, 26, 27, 28, like some of the other speakers have had, and, and be significant while being successful. You don't have to separate the two. So I wanted to throw that in there and I'll just let you keep going on that one. Yeah, you don't have to wait. You can be highly significant and highly successful at the same time. Same time. And, and a lot of people are learning that. But what, I, what I realized is that we didn't know the difference when we were your age. You know, if we thought it had to be one, and then the other, or one or the other. So we thought we had to choose a path, if you will, of significance, and we might call it ministry, we might call it church, we might call it nonprofit, or the path of success. And you don't have to do that, because you can do all those things that are significant with your company. Now, that doesn't mean that if, if you want to be significant in a nonprofit or in the ministry world, do that because that significance is success. But if you have this unction in you, this drive to be an entrepreneur, do it in the business world. Mm. You don't have to grow up and mature and stop doing what you're good at to become significant. You can do it right there while you're doing it. 
the, the, the key is to get the tools, the ingredients, the recipes, the behaviors, learn them early. Don't wait till you've made all those mistakes and then go get them. Get them now, apply them. You really can be the people that can undo that thing of the smart with the big heart. You can undo and you can be the ones that's getting the media, you know, because you're doing the right things instead of that 3% of people that are doing the wrong things that's getting all the attention. Well, what I find fascinating about that, Ford, is you're going to learn these, you're going to learn these lessons or need to learn these lessons anyhow. <laughs> so if you're going to learn, the School of Hard Knocks is an expensive path to learn from. Right, I mean, it's and it's uh, a long path. It's a long, well, it, it, it can be especially <laughs> long if you're not paying attention, right? Because then you repeat them over and over and over again. Um, but it certainly is an expensive path. I used to proudly boast in my bio, made and lost millions, and I realized what a stupid thing to be proud about in my bio. Not the humility of of, of learning from my lessons. But to actually boast about that, I realized, what am I telling the universe? <laughs> right? It's like a continual cycle. It's like, no, I got to change that. I got to come up with a new model. And, and, and that's part of the reason that drove us to put this summit together is so that we can share these, the, the wisdoms. Um, and many of the speakers definitely are in the gray hair set. But many of them are successful millennials as well that have, that have gone through this path and just have learned some insights. And I found, when you were saying that, I, I, I flashed back, John, to, me, to Mickey from Mon the day one of the summit where she partners, she does these really cool projects business-wise, but then she partners in the developing country with either a nonprofit or a for-profit enterprise to do similar work on a contribution model from her sales in the developed world. And sometimes it's a nonprofit and sometimes it's a for-profit entity she partners with. And we, we talked to her about that and she's like, well, but they could do it better. Like they could do it better. It didn't matter to her what the label was. And I think that's part of what I love about what you're saying, Ford, is that you can, you can create this model of contribution regardless of the label, right? Whether you call it a ministry or a not-for-profit or a, or a business. And of course, you can do it in business. So I love that. That's inspiring. Love it. Sorry, John, go ahead. Well, you know, the next step of this, I'm thinking about, you know, um, my friend from Maine always says, you can't get there from here. And the thing That's that prevents really you. That's bad Maine accent. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm from Minnesota and I live in Colorado. <laughs> Don't forgive me. But here's the point. You keep, the, the, what's preventing entrepreneurs and people listening right now, Ford, from getting there from here are constraints, personal professional, their life, things that come together. And this is something that you excel at is helping people examine, realize, and, and either manage the constraint, remove the constraint, or go around the constraint. And I'd love for you to share a little bit for these entrepreneurs listening um, about this, this whole topic. Okay. Well, you know, the term we use, as you know, John, is transformation. And transformation is the Greek word uh, from the Greek word metamorpho, which just means changing from something you are to something else. Now, you can apply that word to a company or a person or any organization, two or more people. And so if, if that's your starting point. And so if you want to grow your company, if you want to grow as a leader yourself, if you want to grow your, per, your marriage, your relationship with your children, there's a transformation that takes place. Well, that just means change. And change is a process. Well, there's four levels of change that a person goes through or an organization goes through. And the first three are personal. And, and the first three levels, the first one is knowledge. Do you have the knowledge you need to make the change you want to make? That's the easiest level. The second level is attitude. Uh, once you have the knowledge, do you have the attitude that it takes to really make the change? Do you, do you have the desire? And the third one is the actual behavior. Now, now will you do the behavior? Now, you may, have, you may know someone who's quit smoking, and you may have heard this before. I can quit smoking anytime I want just to prove it. I've done it a hundred times. <laughs> like me, I'm a person who's lost a thousand pounds. And so for years I would gain weight, lose weight, gain weight, lose weight until I started realizing that even if you have the knowledge and the attitude, the behavior is still difficult. But once you have that, the fourth level of change is organizational, relational, or cultural change. And so if you want to grow your company, you have to personally go through those three levels. In other words, you have to have the information, the knowledge, you have to have the attitude, and then you have to change whatever behavior it is to go from here to there. Okay, so to go from one day, well, that's pretty good for a Southern Texan, that's huh? That's pretty good, yeah, here yeah. to there. Okay. I'm embarrassed now. Okay. 
<laughs> my hippocampus is kicking in for so 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 knowledge <laughs> attitude behavior knowledge attitude and behavior so you know people listening in are getting some knowledge right they they obviously because they've shown up and 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 uh, you know we we haven't said this enough on the on the interviews but thank you for showing up to listen to our speakers everyone because you're the 10 percent. i mean the reality is people that sign up for summits 10 percent show up and the other 90 percent listen to the recordings or don't show up at all so the fact you're listening shows that you've got the attitude to get something done bridging that to behavior let's let's talk about that for a bit because we're we've got about uh 15 20 minutes left in the hour what are some of the insights you would suggest for someone to shift that behavior maybe they've been through the knowledge attitude and they keep looping back you know they recognize it and they're sick and tired of that and they want to make that what are some of the steps advice uh insights you would get on okay how do you shift that behavior Okay, well, if we understand when we're going through change, there's certain dynamics that are in place in us and the team around us. You know, they feel alone, they feel awkward, ill at ease. You're going to be afraid you don't have enough resources. Well, you know, people are at different levels of change or different levels of readiness. They can only handle so much change at once. Change is a choice. In other words, there's all these dynamics in play when change is taking place. Well, that's another level of knowledge that would be important for you to have. What are those dynamics? Once you know what they are, then you can have some strategies to overcome each dynamic. Mm. Well, if you know what the strategy is to overcome that dynamic, now you need the tools, ingredients, and behaviors to implement toward that strategy. And so all that goes into play. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, I teach, Tom, is that uh, outside the box thinking doesn't work. Now, let me explain that, because if outside the box thinking worked, we would already make change. Why is that? Because outside the box thinking only deals with one thing, and that's the knowledge. That's the thought, because we'll, we all have a way of thinking that's in a box. We go somewhere, maybe on here. You know, you may get motivated by one of the speakers you hear to go really do something. So you're motivated. You have a new thought. But what happens is we leave that box. And, and when it gets uncomfortable, what do most of us do? Sad that just, most people quit, right? We get on our hands and knees and we crawl back in that box. I mean, we don't just, <laughs> you know, we don't step back in it. We slither back into it. <laughs> and then later we go somewhere and we get that knowledge again and we get back out and it gets uncomfortable and we crawl back in. And so I argue that to make change, you have to change your thinking before you leave the box. And the new thought has to be, you ready? I'm going to grow my company, whatever it is you're going to do, whatever the vision is you're going toward, write it on a piece of paper. One of the tools we teach is VP MOSA, how to write a vision, purpose, mission statement that actually has objective strategies and action plans. But know where you're going first and know before you leave to go, it's going to get uncomfortable. And make the decision before you leave. Here you go. You ready? This is a big one. That when it gets uncomfortable, refuse to crawl back in that box. And if you refuse to crawl back in, you'll reach a new level of thinking that I call beyond the box. Mm. And when you get beyond the box, you'll know it because it's just as uncomfortable to crawl back as it is to keep going. And if you stay out of it long enough, and if you have the tools, ingredients, and behaviors, and if you don't try to do it alone, because that's one of the dynamics we teach, don't do it alone. We teach a concept called bumper buddies. We don't have time for that right now. But do it with other people. You'll turn your back on that old box that old way of thinking, that old behavior, that thing that wasn't working. You'll have all those new things that you've learned. You'll have the experiences that didn't work. You'll take all those with you and you'll start thinking in a whole different way that we call thinking beyond the bubble. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when a bubble is formed, the pressure on the outside and the pressure on the inside is the same. What happens to every bubble? It's eventually going to burst. So what do we do? We have to get in a new way of thinking. And when you reach that way of thinking, now you're in that continuous improvement model because you know, you know we teach expect the unexpected. You know things are going to come. You know it's now going to be easy er because you have the tools. It's not just easier, it's easy er because you have the teaching, training, equipping, the tools, the ingredients, the behaviors. Now you know that in this new place, either the pressure on the inside, in here, or the pressure on the outside it could be the economy. It could be losing a customer. It could be getting a big customer that you're not sure how you're going to deal with it, whatever it is, but the pressure changes, but you expect it. You're no longer thrown off your game 
when it comes. Like, oh no, what do I do now? Because you're expecting the unexpected. Now you easily shift into a new way of thinking instead of crawling back into the old box because you can't crawl back into the bubble because the bubble doesn't exist anymore in that way of thinking. Well, we only need about 14 more hours with Ford. What do you say, John? Should we just uh, postpone all the rest? <laughs> I got to tell you, Ford, no, this, man. This, uh, I hope you guys are catching this. This is like so gold. I love it. I love it. I love it. Listen, everything maybe, is so practical. Maybe it's just for me, John. Maybe everyone else is fine and they're like not uh, – but I'm like I'm, – I'm, I'm loving this at so many levels. This is awesome. And uh, Do I need to go to box crawling back into anonymous Ford? That's it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a 12 step program for this, but what, you know, what, uh, go ahead. Hello. My name is Ford Taylor <laughs> I belong, and I am a box crawling back in anonymous person. I mean, I am <laughs> so we got to get there, but we're not a box crawler anymore. But we're <laughs> a well, you know, it reminds me of that book leadership and self-deception too, right? And a lot of things you teach, it's a lot of this comes from, you know, we have a thought that thought is influenced by everything that's happened in our life, previous experiences. We have a thought and it could be like you talked about from an external force or, or Tom says something to me. It could be positive or negative, but there's always this filter that I'm running it through. Creates that thought. My body moves into a, a feeling positive or negative and, and the brain floods with chemicals and there's positive chemicals and negative chemicals that affect the different parts of the brain. And that leads to our actions. Because you talked before, Tom, about how do I really change behavior? And to change behavior, if you really start thinking about it, you back up from behavior and actions to feelings to thoughts. And then the big question is, where do those thoughts come from? And I know this is, as we wrap up, this might be a great place to uh, talk about. It's something, it's a tool because it's been really helpful to me uh, that you've taught me for it. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Because I think it's a great place for people to start that are, that are you know, um, certifiable 12-steppers like myself. There you go. Well, you know, we talked about the knowledge, the attitude, and behavior. So that's one set of research. There's another set that talks about what you talked about that says that all day long information comes in and our senses are kicked off. And I call that an event takes place. Well, when an event takes place, we immediately have a thought. From that thought, it does generate a feeling. And from the feeling we pick an action, reaction, or behavior. And so we behave based on how we feel. We feel based on how we think. And as you said, all those different chemicals kick off. And so if we have a thought, for example, you have no right to talk to me that way, mm. the chemical kicks off called epinephrine. Well, epinephrine kicks in, which causes anger, which causes us to fight or flight. Our brain shuts down at less than half capacity, and we act irrational. Well, if I know that, if I've never heard that before and I don't know it, then I don't realize how dumb I get when I get angry. Mm. Well, my new thought is it's not logical to be stupid. So why would I have thoughts that cause my epinephrine to kick in? <laughs> dopamine to kick in. Dopamine is the stuff that kicks in and causes us to smile. It causes us to be exhilarated. Well, I'm going to be a lot better leader when I'm smiling because I'm smarter than I am when I'm angry. The problem is, most of us have never been taught where all that comes from. Uh, and the truth is we all have things that have happened to us our whole lives. And, and if these things come with passion or emotion plus purpose or meaning, they're stored in something called our hippocampus. And once they get stored in there later in life, when we see the same kinds of things that have happened to us in the past, our brains can't process it. We immediately jump to it's going to have the same outcome. So someone's gum they could be chewing gum that smelled like what was being chewed when I was five years old, whatever. And I could respond to what happened when I was five, yet it has nothing to do with what happened just now. Yeah. I've been someone that was sexually abused at six years old by a female school teacher. Well, that sent me down a pattern of life on how to deal with women. And typically you become a, a, a woman pleaser or a woman hater. I became a woman pleaser. Well, that impacted how I lived my life for a lot of years. Well, I realized that these things that are in our hippocampus, it's not what's happened. It's not the things that we've done that keep us from becoming better leaders. It's the lies associated with those things. Mm. And if we can remove the lies associated with what happened, then all of a sudden the pain of what happened, the thing that mom and dad did, that the school teacher did, that the coaches did, that I did, 
that the spouse did, that the children did, that the aunt and uncle did, that the, the junior high kids did calling you fat. So, I mean, all those things that happen that are stored in there, that those lies that we could not think like adults when those happen. But now we can remove those lies. We can replace them with the truth. And when we do that, we don't have near as much epinephrine kicking in, a lot more dopamine. And when we're thinking that way, we're much more influential, much more powerful, much more humble. I mean, all those things come together. You know, John and Tom, some people say that experience is the best teacher. That's not true. Okay. The consequences from the experience are the best teacher. Mm -hmm. So what happens is if, if you go get the knowledge you need and you have good consequences from that knowledge, those good consequences can be as good a teacher as those bad experiences that people talk about. Huh. Because you have, if you, if you have bad experience and bad consequences, those are great teachers. But if you have the knowledge to have good experience with good consequences, those are just as good a teacher as the bad ones are. Absolutely. So I don't, so, but we keep promoting, you know, experience is the best teacher as if bad experience is the only way to learn. That's just not true. Good experience, good knowledge, good information, good training that generates good consequences is also an equally good way to learn. Mm -hmm. And doing what you're doing is offering the opportunity to people that I don't think we really had when we were growing up. I don't, I don't think that the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored to even be in a lineup like you've put together. It's, I'm not sure how I got here, but I appreciate it. But, but to bring this information to these people at this age that we didn't have access to, I mean, that just is a whole nother level. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to put, I'm very thankful that you shared that and, and want to kind of put things in context because people might be wondering, today is Build Your Tribe Day, right? And here's what I want to share with people is the secret, the key behind building a tribe and having influence and building a large organization is really about being the best you, being, you know, bringing out that authentic value. And as you're, you know, you've heard Ford speak and you move toward level five leadership personally and, and those kind of relationships that Ford talked about. And then you bring that into your company, your teaching training, equipping, and empowering. Um, Ford, maybe you, because you got your, your group just purely through working with people and the results and the word of mouth um, with the work that you've been doing the last 10 years. You've done, if I understand it, almost no marketing, no promoting, no email messaging. I would love for you to, and I know you're moving into that area now because uh, kind of God's put that on your heart. But what does that look like? How many companies have you worked with? How many countries are you in? And this just comes from you and your team working on being the best you and delivering the best value that you can without even <clears throat> promoting. Yeah. Yeah, John, you know, one of the things I learned a few years ago, and it was a hard, hard lesson. I'd always heard the data that, you know, 55% of everything we communicate is made up of our body language. 38% is our tone of voice and 7% is our words. Mm -hmm. well, I've heard that before, but you know, the difference in data and information. Well, one day I learned the information. I was looking at my, my life. I was looking at the research and realized no one's teaching the information. They're only teaching the data. And mm -hmm. here's the information around that data. That when your body language and your tone of voice do not line up with your words, that you have little to no credibility. But when your body language and your tone of voice do line up with what you say, you have tremendous credibility. Let's take ISIS, for example. They say, we're going to kill you, and they kill you. They got lots of credibility. And so I started realizing that, that part of why some of the training I did in the old days didn't work is my body language and tone of voice. My private life was not lining up with my words. And if I could just speak quickly to a couple of different groups, if I have time just for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If, if you're a part of, of this meeting right now, if you're listening, I'd like to talk to two different groups. The first group I'd like to talk to is a group that I call believers. It's a group of people that we call ourselves Christians. And I want to challenge you. Does your body language and your tone of voice line up with your words? If you're saying, know Jesus and find peace, do you have peace? Are you praying with your people at 8 o'clock and screaming at them at 10 o'clock? 
Are you going to church and waving your hands in the air and then yelling at your children on the way to lunch and then telling your children you love them? If you're doing this with your employees and your customers, you have little to no credibility. And I just want you to hear that. And I want you to get the tools, ingredients, and behaviors that are practical. So that's what we try to do in TL, not just from us, other people have them too. But get applicable tools that the Bible makes sense to you. Get a foundation of tools that work and that it makes sense. It's applicable, it's practical. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and so I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, bait and switch anyone. If you go out and you do happen to do TL on demand or come to one of our trainings, we're going to give you all those tools and what I call plain glass. They're going to be biblical kingdom principles that work for everybody. And even the Bible says they work whether you believe them or not. And so we're going to give that to you either way. But go find those because they work for everybody. The second group I want to talk to, if you happen to be listening and you're not one of those people that we call a believer or a Christian to tell you, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. Because many of us that you look at is like the guy I was, and I still make mistakes. I just now have the tools to know what to do when I do. The truth is, in many of our places, our divorce rates as high as yours. Our road rage is twice as bad. We take as many antidepressants as you do. We wave our hands and scream at our employees. We don't look any different. And I'm telling you, I don't blame you. And for that, on behalf of those that let me represent them, I'm saying to you, we are wrong. And I'm sorry. And I hope one day that, that you can find a place in your heart to forgive us. And those that are believers, that we can find a way to get the tools, ingredients, and behaviors to truly change the way we think, to change the way we feel, to change the way we behave. So those that don't believe will look and see what we say. And for any of you that could find a place in your heart to forgive us, I'll tell you, John and me and Tom and those many believers that I represent, we give you permission to hold us accountable if you see any time that our body language and our tone of voice do not line up with our words. And you may see that because we're human. We make mistakes. We are not perfect. We're not the perfect leaders, the perfect husbands, or the perfect friends. And I would give you permission with us anytime. Just come up and tell us that isn't what you said. That doesn't look like what you talked about. And I'd ask you that if you ever had the courage to do that and did it, we would very much appreciate it. And the first words out of my mouth will be, is there anything else? And if I did what you did, I will look at you squarely and I will use the six-step apology that we use. I'll tell you I did it. I'll tell you I was wrong. I'll tell you I'm sorry. I'll, give you, I'll ask you to forgive me or when you can to forgive me. I'll give you permission to hold me accountable and I'll let you empty your guns. I'll let you yell at me if you want about any other Christian you've seen or me or the people I represent because I care about you. I want to serve you and I want you to learn to serve your constituents so you can be the best you can be. You can be the most successful entrepreneur, the most successful husband or wife, the most successful parent. So you can be that person that's significant and successful because you can do both at the same time. You don't have to wait. Wow. Outstanding. Thanks for it. Ford, thank you for sharing that. First of all, uh, that was powerful and everything that you've shared is powerful. And I think everybody listening can see why um, I, you know, I've reached out to Ford and just tucked in and, and um, asked him to be part of my life, which he's agreed to do. And we want to give all of you an opportunity to learn everything that Ford does in private, in their consulting engagements with companies at their seminars, and it is probably one of the most professional quality online training courses uh, that's ever been developed. I'm not just saying that lightly. Uh, it's called TLOnDemand.com. And the amazing thing is because Ford, he wants to equip the world. He wants you to move into success and significance together. Um, the whole cost of TL On Demand is only $30 a month. There's no other training course like that at all. And what he's doing for the summit um, is there'll be a discount code. It'll be in your email and it'll give you 50% off of that, that monthly fee. So we're really what talking 14, $15 a month. Um, and you guys can even go to TL on demand, scroll down. There's a spot there that says sneak peek and you can actually even go through the first, first four modules 
completely on your own and see if this is something that you that you really like. But trust me, if you go through it and you apply it and you bring this into your life, the results that you're going to have are going to be very meaningful. So Ford, once again, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time, for sharing, and for being here, my friend. Well, John, thank you. And just to quickly answer your question, yes, we've been in multiple companies. Uh, we're in multiple countries now. And as you said, uh, it's amazing because we've not done a lot of marketing uh, and advertising and, and really believing that, that if we can help people, that's, that's what our vision is, is to do all we can to help those countries and those companies. So thank you how so many, much. Do you know how many companies you've worked in? You know what? I don't. I get that. I should count them up because I, I get that question quite a bit. The, yeah. You know, we have a, a number of people in some of those companies I've never even been in myself. I mean, because we have a team that goes in some of them. So I'm, I'm not sure how to even answer your question. last number I heard was in the thousands, but um, well, I would say thousands of people, but not thousands of companies. Okay. okay. Because, you know, we go in and do citywide trainings where multiple companies can come in and go through the training and some invite us into their organization and some don't, but they still can implement. So based on that, you may be correct. But you know, is- that's, that's a great point for people listening. If you heard this and you do some of the training with TL On Demand, if you want somebody from TL to come in and do a training for your company, uh, put together a seminar to, you know, for your church or a business group and pull together uh, you know, people in different cities, that's available, right, Ford? Yes, and that's why I say if you answer the question from that perspective, it may yeah. be thousands of companies. But if you're talking about us physically going in mm. and consulting and doing long-term projects, it, that wouldn't be thousands of companies. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ford. And Tom, who's up next? Yeah, thanks, Ford. Uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, what an outstanding hour. Uh, if you guys haven't done the VIP upgrade to get the replays, uh, holy cow. And uh, this will be live for 72 hours for everybody. And then, of course, the $97 that'll go to those two great causes if you decide to upgrade. Uh, up next is uh, another powerhouse. In fact, two more powerhouses today. Brad Lominek, uh, now in the next of leadership. Oh, my gosh. what this? We pre-recorded this interview. You're going to be blown away by some of the insights that Brad shares with you. And then the amazing Lisa Sasevich after that. So an hour from now, an hour from now, Brad Lominek, a separate link. You'll see it in your emails. And then Lisa Sasevich. Have an outstanding Thursday focusing on building your tribe. And on behalf of the Strategic Philanthropy Global Summit, thanks for being here. We'll see you on the next one. All right, Ford. Thank, oh my gosh.